the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity. Amen. Amen. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. In, in hearing this verse again and again, these words have always caught my attention. The visual of Jesus disembarking from the boat and stepping out onto the shore amid throngs of people, all people who had shown up to see him. Some wanted to be healed, some just wanted to be near him, but all were compelled to go out to this deserted place to encounter this Jesus character that they had heard about from his disciples. It was only a few verses ago in Mark's gospel that Jesus sends the apostles out in pairs to preach the good news, to cast out demons and heal the sick. And so now there's all of this energy buzzing through the surrounding villages People have heard about this rabbi who's promised release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, who has stopped a woman's hemorrhage and has raised a young girl from her deathbed. And they're yearning to be close to him, to have but even a small taste of what his followers and friends have already tasted. And so they hear that he's going to this deserted place and they all rush there. They drop what they're doing and they go. They don't even take the time to stop and eat or as the text says it, they don't have the leisure to eat. And as Jesus comes to the shore, he sees thousands of people, all vulnerable, lethargic, hungry and ailing and barely hanging on. And he had compassion on them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. You might note that in the citation there are verses excluded from the lectionary's appointed readings. We go from verse 34 to verse 53. I guess that's 34 to 53. Does anyone know what we skip over? What does Jesus do at the lake shore? Bread and fish. Bread and fish. There are thousands of people and what happens? He feeds them. He takes five loaves and two fish, divides it into baskets, and shares them around to the people, to 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And all ate and were satisfied. He took the bread, he broke it, he shared it with them, and all ate and were satisfied. And we'll come back to this story told through John's gospel in the coming weeks when we enter this long stretch of talking about bread. But for now, it's that act that he had compassion on them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. And his response upon seeing the people who had left behind their duties and responsibilities in the middle of the day to go out to this deserted place. His response was to have compassion on them. He saw that they were looking for something, searching for greater things, even just to reach out and touch the hem of his garment, just to have the tiniest opportunity to touch Jesus or to be touched by Jesus. They saw, he saw that they were absolutely desperate to follow him out into the hinterlands because they needed something. And he saw their need. He met it 
and he fed them. And that this takes place in a deserted place indicates to us the hard facts of the situation. That Jesus is meeting the people on the margins, in the far off places, in the pockets of the world where is the most suffering, where the institutions of the world don't care for the needs of the most needful people. All of this speaks to the urgency of that desperation. They hadn't just neglected to pack themselves a lunch before walking 10 miles to hear this preacher, but they didn't have the leisure to do so. It was such an urgent need that they meet this preacher, this rabbi, this Jesus. Many of these people had heard of Jesus' teaching and healing through the apostles in their travel, and they saw that the 12 had something, something that they desired, and so they went. Because even in the most deserted places, the shepherd tends and feeds the flock, even if they're not his flock. Over a year ago, maybe a year and a half even, some of us read the memoir of the Reverend Paul Washington, an Episcopal priest from the Diocese of Pennsylvania, who was once the rector of Church of the Advocate at 18th and Diamond Streets in North Philadelphia. Church of the Advocate is this massive Gothic revival church with these huge stained glass windows and flying buttresses and tall pointy spires in a neighborhood that experienced huge dramatic economic blow as white flight took the German and Jewish working class neighbors out into the suburbs leaving space for black neighbors to move in during the 1950s. And we all know what happens to black neighborhoods. Housing prices drop, policing increases, trees are removed from those quiet residential streets. And within a generation, what was once a thriving neighborhood full of nice cars and well-stocked delicatessens becomes a part of town where you lock your car doors as you drive through, which you never do at night. And so Paul Washington is the priest at this small, failing, predominantly white congregation in a predominantly black neighborhood. When his rectorate began, that congregation was so inward looking that they didn't even have the capacity to admit that they weren't doing a damn thing about the decline of the neighborhood that they once called home. As it experienced great disinvestment every year as more and more black folk moved into the empty North Philadelphia row homes. But Washington had an idea, a vision, a dream. He saw that the black kids around the neighborhood were like sheep without a shepherd. He began a mentoring program he forged a partnership with the police, serving as a chaplain to the neighborhood. He offered funerals for dead black teenagers. He opened the fellowship hall to rival gangs as a space where they could settle their disputes. He invited black artists into the sanctuary to paint 14 huge murals on the walls depicting the history of black people in America. 
he invited the Black Panthers to hold their national conference on black power in the sanctuary. And then later invited them back for the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Conference in 1970. And with all of that, the Church of the Advocate became a hub for the civil rights movement in Philadelphia. With Washington's office hosting meetings with big name activists like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Angela Davis, Sonia Sanchez, and the Church of the Advocate grew and grew and grew, not just by increasing their Sunday attendance, but by becoming such a presence in that North Philadelphia neighborhood that anyone who needed help, anyone who experienced the urgency of desperation, could go there and get that help that they needed. And all because Paul Washington and the congregation at the Advocate saw a need and addressed it. They went from being their own desolate place to being a haven for people to be fed, healed, taught, nurtured, or in other terms, a place where all God's people could grow, flourish, and rejoice. His memoir is titled, Other Sheep I Have, which speaks very much to his ministry in his career, which was defined by looking out across the crowds, seeing that they were like sheep without a shepherd and having compassion on them. His ministry was one of being a truly Christ-like leader, being a shepherd to the wayward sheep and bringing other sheep into one fold. And that's what church should be about. If churches aren't looking to the forgotten people, to the ignored people, the neglected people in our own neighborhood, how can they claim to be God's hands and feet in the world? If we aren't inviting our neighbors to do the work of ministry with us, whether or not they show up on Sunday morning, how do we have a snowball's chance of being there for the next generation? Because the next generation will still need to be fed and clothed and nurtured and loved. And so what opportunities do we have to be a place to belong? Where people want to come and participate in ministries that do God's work. What other sheep are out there, desperate and desolate in deserted places? And how do we bring them from that into a space where they can really feel Jesus' love and power? I invite you to really think about that question, to pray about it, talk about it with one another, with people who aren't part of this community. Because as we continue to visualize what the future of St. Mark's might look like, what changes we need to make to help us better minister to our desperate neighbors, it's an important question to sit with, to discuss, to ponder, all to help us discern what lies ahead on our path. Amen.